Hi, everyone. I see lots of names popping on. This is great. Um, we're going to go ahead and just kind of hang out and let everybody get signed on here for a few minutes and get started right around noon. Okay, I have 12.01, so we'll go ahead and get started and if a few more people um, hop on. Um, this is being recorded, and so we will post this um, online and um, everyone can have access to the full meeting. So welcome everyone, my name is Jessica Green. I'm the Assistant City Manager for the City of Oxford, and I'm so grateful that all of you are joining us today. Um, Ed, I'm gonna go ahead and click next slide. Um, just a few guidelines as we get started today. Um, as you log on, your cameras are turned off and your microphone is muted. We are going to do a brief presentation and then open it up for question and answer. I'll go through how to do the question and answer in a little bit, but you are welcome to type in question and answers during the little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the meeting, we'll also take verbal questions. Um, we're going to do as many questions and answers as we can until 1.30, and then we're going to go ahead and end the meeting. Um, but to be very clear, we're opening public comment for 30 days after today, so through September 11th. Um, and when you do um, submit a public comment, please go ahead and write your name and your address so we have it for the public record. And if you choose to um, raise your hand and speak verbally, please keep your um, conversation, your discussion to three minutes so we can get as many people in as possible. And then once again, we would really encourage you to put in a written public comment at the cityofoxford.org slash trail public input. Next slide, please. Um, so first we'll do introductions. Once again, I'm Jessica Green. I'm the Assistant City Manager for the City of Oxford. Um, I have the pri privilege of working on the uh, trail system. I write a lot of the grants um, and started as Enjoy Oxford with this and have carried it into my career here. So, Sam? Hi everybody, Sam Perry, City of Oxford Community Development Director. Uh, I've also worked on this for a few years and uh, been happy to um, help the community with this project. and. This process has been good for me to hear uh, some of the questions and comments and concerns of the community. And uh, we're, we're, we'll be glad to take those into consideration as we move forward. Some of which may not be handled uh, by the trail project itself, but we'll be sharing those with our department heads and coworkers as we handle some of those concerns. Thank you, Jessica. Good afternoon, I'm Etta Reed with Bear Becker. Um, we are fortunate enough to be selected to work with the city on the Northwestern Arc. We um, were the designers of phase one and phase two, so we're very familiar with the trail to date, and we're very excited to work on the Northwestern Arc and come up with some um, alignments to that portion of the community. 
And then Eric is here with us. Did you want to say hi real quick, Eric? Yeah, hi, I'm Eric Anderson. I'm a planner with KZF Design. And uh, I also had the joy of working on the original 2008 Oats Master Plan and am happy to be back to uh, wrap up the final phase. Wonderful, next slide please. So today what we're going to do is we're gonna go over the goals and purpose of the Oxford Area Trail System. And then we're going to um, really do an overview of what we call the Northwestern Arc segments and all the areas that were reviewed and then some proposed actual routes. Then we'll talk about our next steps and future chances for public comment. And then we'll open it up for your questions and answer. So we'll get through as many as we can today. Next slide. So with that, I wanna give you a brief history of the Oxford Area Trail System. Um, this is a planned system that is nearly 12 miles of multi-use paths that will go around the city of Oxford. The goal is that it would be a 10 foot wide paved multi-use path that is separated from you know, vehicular traffic, ADA accessible, and we're really looking to both provide improved transportation options. So if you wanna ride your bike from home to school or from home to work or to a park, you can, um, and also improve recreational opportunities for those little kids learning to ride their bike and skateboarding and taking a jog with a stroller and um, maybe a, a person in a wheelchair. We wanna provide those recreational opportunities as well. You know, this really has, I, I've heard it's been in the works for decades, and but it really got going in the, in the early 2000s. And in 2007, a group of local citizens hired KZF as a grassroots group and had some design estimates done. Then in 2008, those were shared with the city and um, adopted by council and put into the city comprehensive plan under the transportation chapter as a future goal for the city. And then honestly, the recession hit and not much happened. But in 2013, we really started looking at the trail again. We wrote some grants using those initial KZF estimates and we have been able to build the first few sections. We realized quickly that we needed updated cost estimates, and maybe some route alignment. And so in 2017, we hired an update from Leonard Howe Park to the community park. And we continued writing grants. And then we're like, look, it's time for us to address this final little arc, the Northwest segment. And so we've hired Bayer Becker and KZF to look at that for us. But along the entire way for the whole planning, we've really looked at what's the user experience? What's it like to use this trail? Is it enjoyable? Is it fun? Is it ADA compliant? Is it safe for eight to 80 year olds um, to be out there learning and maybe not as stable on their feet? Is it fiscally responsible? You know, we've passed a levy and we write grants, but can we do it within those parameters? And then finally, is it feasible to construct it in this area? And we really look to the engineers to help us look at, you know, soil and topographic areas and, and things like that. Um, and so that's where we are today. We're going to introduce uh, the routes that were explored by Bayer Becker. And then this opens up a period of 30 days for public comment, because if you're like me, you're going to need time to like really look at the map and how does it impact you. And so after today, this will be posted as a recording, the maps will be posted, and we invite you to share public comment. Um, I want you to remember that this is not final. Think of these as pencil lines. And based on your input, we're going to ask Bayer Becker to, you know, tweak things, move things around a bit, and then it'll go to the Oxford Parking and Transportation Board, which will allow you for some more public comment. And then finally, it will make its way to City Council, which allows for more public comment. And then at the end of the day, what's adopted by Council would be a plan, a plan that we use to then apply for future grants. Um, and just to kind of unite those grants, if we wrote them today, would be coming down the pipeline in year 26, 27, or 28 before we'd actually be doing anything. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Etta Reed to explain um, their process of the feasibility study. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Thanks, Jessica. As Jessica had indicated, Bear Becker and KZF, we have been working on a feasibility study for the four-mile segment on the north side of town. You're probably asking yourself, you know, really, what is a feasibility study, what's taken into account, and, and what all is really involved? So when preparing a feasibility study, what we've done for the Northwestern Arc 
is we, we started with the alignments from 2007 um, and evaluated those as well as some additional routes um, based upon changes in the community, such as additional developments that have come online since 2007, 2008, and just different regulations that have been placed and, and just a variety of conditions and changes within the community. We have looked at both rural, which are considered off-road or on private property routes, as well as urban um, which routes, which are typically adjacent to roadways and located within the public right away. With each route, what we then did was we evaluated and graded, kind of rated the routes with regards to several criteria. One being safety, user experience, access to the trail for the users, the cost and constructability, land acquisition, the environmental impact, as well as maintenance. The, this, this evaluation then resulted in what we would consider a preferred or otherwise known as a recommended alignment, which best met the project goals that Jessica has outlined. What we plan to do today is basically go through the entire four mile, four mile study area and, and go over the alignments that were evaluated and then also present to you our preferred alignment. And then as Jessica indicated, based upon community feedback, we'll reevaluate the alignments make some adjustments and then come up with a preferred alignment. So let's move on and let's start talking about the trail. Next slide, please. So what you see before you is a map showing the existing and the proposed routes um, kind of of this Oats Trail. Segment one from Morning Sun to Bonham Road and segment two from 73, State Route 73 to US 27 have already been constructed while segments three and four, which are the links between Bonham Road and the DeWitt Cabin, and the link from Pepper Park to the high school, as well as the link between middle school and the community park are currently under design. As you can see here, the study area for the Northwestern Art goes from Fairfield Road to the Black Covered Bridge. It's quite an extensive area that goes on the Northwest side of town. Next slide, please. Due to the size of the study area, what we decided to do was to break it into logical segments. So we broke it into four segments so that we can dissect it a little better. So the first segment that we'll talk about today is Fairfield Road to Contreras, which is essentially the Knowles property. Um, then we go from Contreras to US 27, US 27 to Brown Road, and then Brown Road to the Black Covered Bridge. Next slide, please. As, we, as both Jessica and I had indicated, we started with the 2007-2008 previous alignments that were evaluated. As you can see here, this is a map showing the previous alignments that were evaluated and costs, um, costs were developed associated with these. The, the map and the trails that were um, evaluated previously included routes that were located both in the what we would consider rural areas on private property, as well as through neighborhoods on existing public streets within the public right away. So what I wanna do now is let's start talking um, down detail. We've talked very high level to this point. I wanna get down into the detail and let's start breaking it into segments. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So the first segment I would like to discuss is the segment between Fairfield Road and Contreras Road. So in this segment of the trail, we looked at the, the trail, we looked at three alignment options. Starting at the west or the blue cyan colored line, we the, the alignment starts at Fairfield Road, goes along the west property line of the Knolls to Contreras Road. The second alignment we looked at was the green alignment, which you can see follows the existing roadway through the Knolls of Oxford um, development. And the third, and that would be more of what we would consider an urban kind of an urban cross section, an urban trail, and then followed with the um, orange alignment, which would go along Fairfield Road and then proceed north up to Contreras Road following the creek that's located to the east, uh, in the, to the east side of the Knowles of Oxford development. We have met with the Knowles of Oxford and discussed these three alignments with them. Um, while the, the, the alignment straight up Knollwood Drive would, by, would be the most cost-effective alignment because there is some walk there and we could 
um, utilize the existing um, roadway network that's there, they would prefer to, for us to follow the orange alignment, which is more of a rural alignment um, to the eastern portion of the property, and they are willing to grant us an easement for this, this trail. So this would be our preferred alignment for this segment of the, the trail. Um, next slide, please. So you hear me mention rural trail section, urban trail section. So I wanna, before we go much further, I'd like to kind of talk about what, what does that mean? What's a rural trail segment versus an urban trail segment? So the rural trail segment is essentially what you've seen if you've um, utilized the trail in sections one and section two. It's essentially a 10 foot wide asphalt path with a two foot shoulder on both sides. And then we have anywhere from three feet or greater of a bit a buffer from the existing vegetation or obstacles um, along the trailway. The, the rural trail is typically constructed on private property. Um, as you've seen with sections one and two, they were constructed on city of Oxford and Miami University property. With the um, rural trail section, if it is to be constructed on private property, trail access easements will be needed or um, the, the city would need to acquire the property from the private property owners so that um, they can be responsible for the liability as well as the maintenance of the trail. Next slide, please. So while a, a rural section um, is, has been the preferred section, typical section to date, that's not always possible or preferred depending upon the location of the trail. So we have also considering it what we were calling an urban trail section. The urban trail section also consists of a 10 foot wide asphalt path or trail that's located within the existing public right of way of an existing street. And what it does, what we would do is we would provide a landscape buffer or as otherwise known as a tree lawn between the trail and the back of curb to provide a little a buffer and as as well as make it aesthetically pleasing for the users of the trail along the roadway. Depending upon the amount of right-of-way that is available, this may require that the existing roadway be narrowed and parking restricted to one side of the street only. So now that we've talked about what an urban trail is versus a rural trail, I want to get into um, talking about another segment. So let's move on to the next slide and talk about Contreras to US 27. So for the Contreras Road to US 27, we are looking to start, as I mentioned, from Contreras Road, taking off from where we left the Knowles of Liberty property. We would head to the east, following the yellow path there at the bottom of the screen, over to um, Prevalent Drive. So we would follow the cyan or light blue alignment of Prevalent Drive, cut over to Old Farm Drive Road, going up to Grace Lane, and then heading over to um, the Oxford Country Club and then crossing the railroad tracks into Mary Day Park and then on to 27. Another alignment that was considered is the orange alignment, which again, we would start at Contreras Road, head, follow the existing lane that heads to the water tower on the Dudley property, go past the water tower to the north end of the Dudley property, heading over to the railroad tracks, on to, and then heading to 27. The another alignment that kind of peels off of the Dudley property that we just that I just outlined for you is the magenta um, alignment, which as you can see, again, we're following the orange alignment there for a little bit, following the water tower drive. We would cut along the rear properties there on Savannah Drive and then head north along the rear properties of the Heritage Vineyard subdivision to cross the railroad tracks into Mary Day Park onto 27. And then lastly, the fourth alignment we considered here was to take Contreras Road to Old Farm Road and then staying in the public right-of-way doing an urban trail section along Old Farm Road, along Country Club Drive, and then crossing the railroad tracks again into Mary Day Park to raise way to US 27. I've, I'm sure you've seen a common theme here. We're trying to tie into Mary Day Park. And that's another um, Oxford Community Park. And what that does is that enables us to have some potential events in the future where we can tie the Mary Day Park 
to the Oxford Community Park, have you know a 5K, a 1K, some nice races around the community. So as you can see here, we've kind of thickened up a couple of these alignments. We have two preferred alignments here. One is up prevalent through the along the back side of Heritage Vineyard to cross the tracks, or up prevalent to Old Farm over to the Country Club, again, to Mary Day Park onto 27. We have met with the Oxford Country Club and um, they are in support of this, um, of us utilizing the Northern portion of their property and crossing into the Mary Day Park. So um, that is our proposed alignments for Contreras to um, US 27. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the next segment is US 27 to Brown Road. We looked at three segments here, three um, possible alignments, um, two what we would consider rural trail routes and one urban trail route. So starting with the rural routes, you see a cyan or light blue colored route coming from 27 uh, heading north and, and going through the larger acreage tracks there that butt up to the backside of Hester Road. And so this the Cyan route goes along the north side of the properties over to Brown Road and then going along Brown Road to start heading over towards the Black Cover Bridge. The uh, second rural route we considered here is the green alignment. The green alignment, which again is a rural route and it would start at 27 go um, through kind of the south side of those acreage tracks along the back side of the home, the properties along Hester Road. It would be on the acreage tracks and then just kind of fall along those perimeters heading to Brown Road. And then lastly, we did consider, we are considering an urban route for this segment, which is the magenta route. What we would do is we would start at 20, Seven, utilize the existing path that's there on 27 and then follow the existing right away of Hester Road to Jacob, Jacob Drive. Utilize the existing trail that connects Honor and Defour, then following along Northridge Drive over to Brown Road. Again, this is an urban route um, that we would be considering. Um, for this segment of the trail, as you can see, we do have two, we are um, considering two preferred routes, the rural route, which is the green alignment, as well as the urban route, which is the magenta alignment. Next slide, please. So the last segment is Brown Road to the Black Covered Bridge. For this segment of the trail, we have considered three um, possible alignments. So starting at the top, we have the green alignment, which is a rural alignment going along Brown Road to the north, and then heading through the larger acreage tracks to the east um, to tie into the brown to the black covered bridge. We're considering an urban route, which would follow along Kelly Drive in the public right of way, and then tie in at Kelly and Morning Sun at the existing trail. And then lastly, we have the yellow route, which would go um, through the Hawks Landing development and then the office condominiums, and again tying in to the existing trail there at Kelly and Morning Sun. So as you can see by the heavier lines, we are considering um, our preferred options as the rural route, which is the green route, and the urban route, which is Kelly Drive. Next slide, please. So what we have done is we've taken all the four segments and we, as I've indicated, we have preferred alignments for um, each of these. And so what we've done is we combine these all into one map so you can kind of see how they all tie together. Um, the blue is considered our urban routes and the yellow are considered our rural routes. Um, and at this time, these are our preferred alignments. And what I'd like to do is hand it over to Jessica to talk about the next, pro next step. Yeah, so thank you, Etta, for um, that analysis of your review. So what we're going to do now is um, enter into the um, kind of the feedback and Q&A section of the meeting. Once again, you have until September 11th to do this. So I understand completely if you want to take some time, um, look at the maps once they're posted this afternoon, really gather your thoughts and then share that feedback. 
Um, then what we will do is based on that feedback, we'll reevaluate the alignment, adjust it a little bit, and then Bayer Becker will prepare what's called a 30% preliminary design plan with a cost and estimate that gives us enough to then apply for those future grants. After being reviewed by the Oxford Parking and Transportation Board, a recommendation will go to City Council um, for adoption of this plan, and then that allows us to then seek for future funding, which we, we don't have any grants in mind right now, but it sets the stage for us to apply for future things. Next slide, please. So our preferred way for today is for you to type your comment into the Q&A um, and then also to type in your public comment into this cityofoxford.org slash trail public input. The reason is that gives us a written record of your public comment and really helps us to kind of post frequent questions and frequent answers um, up on the website. You're also welcome to email um, Ms. Etta Reed at BayerBecker.com. She's kind of tabulating all the public comments for us and they're due by September 11th. If you would also like to raise your hand and, and speak today or type in a comment, we'll get to as many as we can in the next, we have about an hour or so to do this. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so currently your cameras are off and your microphone is muted. We uh, ask if you do raise your hand that you limit your time to three minutes and you state your name and your address for the record. And if you are on the phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. For the most of you who are on the computer, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, um, the raise hand button, the QA button, um, and then the mute and unmute button. So with that, what we're going to do is take kind of a combo of written questions and raised hand questions as we go um, throughout, throughout this portion of the meeting. So I'm going to pull up the first one here. Um, there was a question, um, you know, did we consider impact to existing homeowners on the proposed path? Um, and so, yes, this is a portion of the trail that's going to impact private property much more so than the other segments of the trail that we have planned, which is why we've really developed this really um, more thorough public input process with the 30 days, um, the mailer that went out, and um, allowing for the comments online and the, and the recorded video. We, a similar question came in, like, did we consider having a, a meeting with residents of the neighborhoods prior to this? And, you know, what we did is we kind of did two things. Um, one was if if the prop, the trail was planned to go on your property, like we were going to have to somehow acquire land from you, we did send a special letter to you and have a special meeting talking about the possible acquisition of that land. If the land went if the trail went near you, but was in maybe the city right away or in close proximity, we did not have a special meeting before this one. This is that meeting. And then we're opening it up for 30 days then for those neighborhoods and those residents to give comment. So that was our, our thought about that. Um, let's see, we, do we have any, I'm looking to see if we have raised hands. I'll take a raised hand question here. All right, I see one. Um, Ms. Urkel, go ahead. Hi, my name is Heidi Eckerly, and I am a resident on Country Club Drive. And I have a couple of questions. Um, my first question is um, about the amount of space into the front yards that would be utilized using the urban um, path on the streets in our neighborhood? Yes, so the goal would be if we did what I'm gonna call the urban route to really not take front yards. It would be to stay within the city right of way, which is why in some cases it might require limiting to parking on one side of the street instead of two. But our, we are not proposing taking private property of front yards and very much proposing staying within the city right of way. Okay, and I am a current trail user and support our trails as they are currently in place. However, I have some serious safety concerns for the users of the trail. Um, 
following these urban routes. I have biked with my family all over the state of Ohio and use multiple different trail systems. And it just seems like an excessive amount of driveways and streets to cross. And that really worries me. If our goal is in fact to safely connect Mary Day Park to the community park, um, then I think it needs to be a priority to find the safest route possible for anyone from age eight to 80, as you've said, to access these areas. I know that there are kids that would love to be able to get from park to park, but having to cross all of those driveways with people backing out, pulling in all of those street crossings, it just doesn't seem to be the safest option in my opinion. Thank you, Ms. Eckerly, um, for your comments today. And um, that leads to kind of one of the next questions is, is what are the advantages and disadvantages of an ur a rural and urban route? Um, and so I'll start with the rural route. The advantages of the rural route are um, it's completely off-road. There are very limited driveways. Um, it's a very, tends to be a more recreational use. Um, the cons are that it, for this particular segment, acquire, requires a lot of private property acquisition. And if you can imagine, if someone was asking to come into your property, that might not be very supported. And so there are significant challenges in property acquisition for a rural route. For the urban route, the positives um, become a little bit more like transportation. You know, you could hop on the route and ride the school or it becomes part of your neighborhood um, network. And it could be I think just a really nice neighborhood aesthetic. The negatives are exactly what Ms. Eckerly talked about is the driveway access. And there will be lots of driveways and just needed awareness um, through a more urban um, system like that. And it does perhaps in some places limit parking to one side of the road. I'm going to take the next raised hand, which is, oh, This is a challenging name, but I'm gonna go ahead and say, is it Vieta? Go ahead. Vieta, if you would, at the bottom of your screen, click unmute. Okay, we'll come back. Um, the next raised hand I have is, um, boy, people don't have their names on here, so it's a little bit hard. But the next name I see is Job JM. Go ahead. Job JM, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm looking at the map here. I see the blue and the yellow. Are those the only two paths you're considering or because there were others in the previous map? Etta, would you wanna explain that a little bit? Sure, so um, we are considering all the routes still. None of the routes are off of the table. As a matter of fact, um, as these are just pencil lines on a piece of paper. If a new route came to light um, and it seemed, you know, and it, it met all our criteria, we would definitely consider it routes we haven't even discussed today. So what this map, the blue and the yellow show, these are the preferred alignments, but by no means are they the final alignments. Okay, thank you very much. Because if there are others that are gonna be considered, we really can't ask questions to them if we don't know what the target is. I recall there was one along Old Farm Road and then on Contreras. Which side of the road on Old Farm Road was the path proposed? At this time for the urban routes, we have not, um, we need to do more investigation to determine the exact side um, that it would need to be on. Um, we need to take into consideration the existing utilities that are out there, um, existing vegetation, um, you know, just the, the whole intersections, you know, if we can stay on one side of the road and minimize the number of crossings, that would um, help us with the safety. So the final determination on which side of the road for um, the urban routes have not been determined yet. So that's very uh, kind of uh, troubling because it matters to us who live there. 
And frankly, I don't want any bike path on Old Farm Road or Contreras at all. I don't want it. And I don't want any path behind my lot by the golf course. You said safety, eight to 80, people get hit by golf balls. And that's not safe for children. It's not safe for anybody actually. And furthermore, there are underground utilities that border my lot and the golf course. And I don't, were, were these things taken into account? Because you talked about safety, eight to 80. Yeah, I'll take that. So yes, um, we definitely take safety of all things into consideration, whether that's, you know, the use on the trail and safe for vehicular traffic, but like you said, also like golf balls and local farmland and things like that. So we do, when we build the trail, bring in safety considerations, and that could be, you know, let's imagine if it was through a back of your neighborhood, we could look at things like privacy fences or fences to block golf balls and things like that. So it is a planning process. And the, the important thing to remember today is that we're looking at possible routes that kind of remain just a line on a piece of paper until we really start thinking about construction. And that's when we really start digging deep and um, figuring out the actual physical um, alignment is when we get a lot closer to the actual construction. Yeah, but that's when we really need to make the critique because if we don't know what the target is, how can we make a criticism or, or, or effective input? And frankly, I don't want any privacy fence bit, built behind my lot. There's a golf course there and I don't want people walking behind my lot getting hit by golf balls and utility, underground utilities are there. It just seems like that wasn't taken into consideration and I would exhort you to think a little more carefully about these things. And I've talked to, you know, many, another thing, 12 noon for this conference was very inconvenient to people working and I've had several feedback on it and they're not very happy about that. So I think that should be on the record. Thank you for sharing your comment. Um, I will say there are 130 people here, um, but we will make a record of that. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. I just saw a couple of written questions I wanted to answer if that's okay. Please. Uh, yes. Same from uh, community development. Question from Emily about um, the path in Do Four and Honor in the Northridge subdivision. The answer to that question is yes, there is an easement. Uh, we will be looking further into that um, just to check into the uh, the history of that easement. But yes, there is a public easement between Honor and Due Four uh, for the existing path that's there now. So thank you for that question, Emily. One from Paul about uh, grant requirements um, as far as the funding for the trail. Really good question because that the way the funding is, obviously there is a tax levy that was passed in 2018, uh, which helps to fund this. But the reason for that was to match uh, with grant requirements with grant funding for state and federal grants. And so to Paul's question, the funding sources do have requirements for the way the trail is designed uh, for safety, for slope, for um, accessibility, handicap accessibility, different types of modes of transportation. So good question. And yes, there is limits on if that, if that funding uh, comes from a certain source, then the trail has to be designed a certain way and accessible to certain types of modes of transportation. So, so that's all, Jessica. Just a couple of questions I want to answer while we had those. Thank you. I have a written question regarding um, liability and maintenance of the path. And so when the path is constructed, the city assumes responsibility for the maintenance and care and the liability of that path. And we can even go so far as to add the private property owners as a named insured if we're on private property and we don't own the property. So in some cases, the city would get an easement um, and take that approach. And in some cases, we would purchase the property. And then the city becomes the owner of that property and, and, we, and has full responsibility. Um, I, I like to think of this as a long linear park. In the city of Oxford, we take care of our parks very well. I'm going to take a, a verbal question here. I have uh, Mr. Wagner. Mr. Wagner, go ahead. Hi, how are you? Sean Wagner, 601 Honor Lane. Uh, question for you, uh, you know, for the area between Brown Road and 27, those, those of us who live there, we know it is a highly congested area with cars that travel through high speeds. There's already been some things that have been implemented, included medians that, that try to slow down that traffic, but, but to no avail. 
obviously safety is a, a concern uh, for those that are going to be traveling this path. Uh, what was considered regarding uh, the, the uh, traffic in this area? I'll take that one. Um, there hasn't been a traffic analysis yet on this. This is a preliminary route study, uh, Sean, and thank you for that question, by the way. Um, and I think some of the things that were historically done uh, with that subdivision actually were done for that very concern of speed and traffic concerns. And so as we hear, you know, especially if there's more of these kinds of concerns, uh, we will definitely pass those along to the to the other city staff that handle that regardless of where the trail uh, may end up. So uh, to answer your question, we haven't done a traffic analysis yet on how uh, the, the path would integrate with the existing uh, traffic that's out there. So that could potentially be part of it, uh, but just because of the limitation of the funding for this feasibility project, uh, a traffic study was not included within the budget. Okay, yeah. and, and I think the natural part is obviously that it's the cut through right from 27 for, for anyone that doesn't want to go through a town to, to have quick access to the retail options more than town. Um, I, I'd like to add on to that. This is Etta Reed. Um, what we find too is, um, you know, as I'd indicated with the urban section, we would be looking to to um, potentially narrow the streets up some. And as you narrow the streets, what that tends to do is that's, kind of, that's a traffic calming method. So that will tend to slow the drivers down also as they drive through the roadway. So um, it's, it's really an added benefit um, to, to the community there. Thank you. Uh, what, just one other, one other question, just in general for any homeowner that might be impacted that's on the path. Um, what kind of general statistics can you all provide or analysis that was done around how property value might be impacted uh, or even crime? What, what should we know about that as, as we're considering uh, providing feedback? I can take that one. So in general, houses that are um, nearby multi-use trails actually see an increase in property values. And so that's been a probably a proven fact over time in many, many, many communities. And as far as safety, safety is generally not an issue on these types of multi-use trails. Trail users are trail guardians and um, they really protect their, if you wanna think of it as a linear park, they protect this amazing community resource. Say that being said, we do have um, safety um, we have our public safety police officers who have bikes and we have the, the trails are graded for, you know, if we had to, we can get an emergency vehicle on there. And so um, we feel that these would be both safe and a benefit to your property value in the area. Has, has uh, reports of, of various crimes been tracked around where the trail is going to be implemented? We have not gone into that level of analysis. Thank you. Any further questions, Mr. Wagner? No, uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see. Um, there is a question about can the crossing at 27 be grade separated? Mr. Perry. I'll take that one. Um, yeah, I love the idea of that. Uh, that's a good one, Carla. Uh, we, we haven't gotten to that level of detail yet. Uh, there, there is limitations on the number of signalized crossings on 27, as you may be familiar. Uh, so the spacing between those does make a challenge uh, if we were going to have a, a grade separated or an underpass or an overpass, as it were. Uh, so the goal would be if we cannot cross at uh, Mary Day or uh, Melanie, where there's an existing signal, would be to add what's called a rapid flashing beacon. Uh, so the short answer is no, we haven't considered a grade separated crossing. Um, if someone were to donate the funding for that, obviously that would be preferable. Uh, but that does take a lot of land because of the, uh, the slope requirements for ADA. But thank you for the question. That's good input. Okay, I'm going to take a Miss um, Brown. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Tomoko Brown, and I live on 100 Prevalent Drive. We are at the, um, we, I live at the corner of Prevalent and Contreras. So looking at this map, um, the rural, both rural and urban um, route seems to go through the pre all the prevalent. And um, this was the first time we heard, and uh, which is a little surprising. But anyway, um, I have, um, I, I guess I, I have a couple of questions. So the, looking at the rural 
route, the yellow one, all of them seems to go on the rural area and behind the property, except prevalent. Uh, have you noticed that? <laughs> and then um, can you do anything about that? I mean, um, the, the, they call rural for reason. They are, you're avoiding driveways and um, housings. And um, seems like to me, it's not rural to us. Um, is somebody can answer that question? Why is it in front of um, going to the um, subdivision instead of going behind the housing in, um, like any other part of the rural, uh, rural route? I'm not sure. We might have to get back to you on that answer, but Etta, would you be able to speak to that at all? Okay. Ms. Brown, we'll no, have to. No, not at this time. Okay. Ms. Brown, we'll take your comments into consideration. And if that's something we'll we'll look into, see if we can um, look at. Um, I have um, one more question. Um, um, we, you guys talked about the um, studies done and the um, trails being safe. Um, but what is going to happen at night. Um, things are wide open, there's nothing, no gate, nothing. Um, I'm a little bit concerned um, um, the situation at night because it goes through, um, it goes in front of our house. Um, is there anything done by, uh, is there any plan for the, uh, by the police department um, to study research and, um, you know, um, to add um, um, patrols? I mean, is there anything like that done yet? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. And um, one, I think we that's something we would absolutely address when we get into the part where we're actually planning on doing this um, would be a consideration of the safety um, in, in maintenance of the trail system. Like, what does it look like? How is it patrolled? Um, how is safety maintained? Right now, we're still looking at the route, but you're right. That's something that we would need to consider. I would imagine that we would have patrols of our officers um, in that area. Um, I'm not talking about during the day, but I, I, especially yeah. I am a little concerned. Yes. Um, is there any, um, because it's going through the prevalent in both route, are you guys meeting with us, just speaking with us? Are you guys, um, many of us, couldn't part, uh, participate in the meeting today because it's at noon, which is a problem uh, for many of us. And um, is there any meeting that can be held um, with you guys, with the prevalent um, drive residents? Because it, both of the routes, preferred route lo looks like it's gonna go through. And I think you, we have lots of questions. Yep, yeah, Ms. Brown, this, I would ask you to please use that public comment form and write all of your questions and you can request a meeting and we, we can help um, have that, but it'll probably be after the open comment period of September 11th while we really take all of this feedback. And then, you know, then we have then another round of opportunity for public comment as we start to narrow down those final route al alignment recommendations. So, thank, thank you, Ms. Brown. All right, I'm going to try to answer a few written questions, kind of asking about the um, urban routes with where there's existing um, maybe um, medians already there and those kind of things. So for the urban route, that would require a full level of analysis of, and, and really it would change some of these roads and sidewalks a bit. You almost have to imagine that we would, um, we would probably have to take out those mediums that are there now and put the path in and a new tree line and then that road would be narrowed um, and so that narrowed road is what causes the traffic calming that would slow people down but it would require a fair amount of analysis before we would really have some of these nitty-gritty answers for you on the urban routes is that fair to say etta yes absolutely yes we need to um 
basically look at each roadway segment item by item and see what would work. We got to coordinate with the other city departments, such as fire and public works, to make sure that the if as we narrow the roadways and adjust utilities, that it works for them also. We have a question saying, um, can you please put up the side by side of the rural versus urban trail pictures again? Um, could we do that, Etta, just so people can kind of see? Yeah, I see. Okay, so you'll see here, this is the, what would be considered the rural route, which is if you've used phase, phase one or phase two, it looks very much like this. Um, it's a very um, kind of in the woods or out in the field and you're not near neighborhoods. And if you could show the next one, this is what we would consider an urban route. I call this a bike boulevard in my brain. Just, I imagine it as a lovely paved asphalt sidewalk instead of a concrete sidewalk that's very wide and tree lined and protected from the street. But on the other side, you would have residential houses. So thank you, Anna. All right, we'll take a verbal question. I have a person named Terry, no last name, go ahead. Terry? Try Terry. unmuting. There we go. There we go, Terry, go ahead. Okay, it's Terry Hughes. I live at 6141 Hester Road. Um, we have about 700 yards, I believe, that you wanna put a rural trail through. And um, I would like you to tell the listeners and make a matter of record that we are very much against it. And we don't, we'll do whatever we can to stop it. We don't want the trail on our property. Uh, actually, we don't want it in the neighborhood on Hester Road or Jacob. We realize it's going to go somewhere. And we've had lots of ideas, such as going up Brown Road to the middle of town and then out Contreras to tie all those uh, businesses uptown where people could get a pizza, stop and play in the fountain, and then continue out Contreras and pick up your trail. That would eliminate the uh, railroad tracks and the high density traffic on US 27 North. And it'd be like taking a slice of pie out of your loop. And uh, we don't really understand why it has to be a circle. I've, I've heard your explanations already. I've had several meetings with these folks and um, they're, they're good people. And I'm hoping we can all find a way to work this out. But acquiring property from the rural property owners uh, has several obstacles, and I will let you guys tell if you want to what they are. And I would like to have a question about the urban routes because I've met with several people on Hester and Jacobs subdivision. The two pictures you showed of the, the wooded path versus the sidewalks. The people on the urban route, their sidewalks, they're worried about their yards being shrunk drastically from the inside of the sidewalk to their house. The picture you showed, it looks like the inside of the sidewalk that is currently in existence on these homes would be as far as the, uh, you know, the acquisition of their front yards would go. Like it goes from the inside of their sidewalk out into the street. Is that correct or, or would it require more property? Uh, I can take that. Um, hi, Terry, um, great question. Um, so what the plan is, is for the urban route is that we would basically the trail would start at the back of walk, which is essentially the, in most instances, the existing public right of way and then go towards the street. So the front yard that the homeowner has should not be, re would not be reduced. We're basically just utilizing the land that's in the public right of way. And then we would take that curb line and pull it, you know, reduce the road width by taking out some asphalt and moving again that curb line away from their home. Okay, that's a that's good, I think. I think that'll make a lot of people happy that I've spoken to. Uh, another note on my personal property, which I'm gonna fight to keep a trail off of, but it's, it's odd to me that part of that uh, preferred rural trail splits one of my 10 acre fields into two uh, five acre fields. I, 
that baffles me why you wouldn't stay on the perimeter of anybody's property that you're proposing this either urban or rural i think it you know it should skirt people's property that are impacted by it it should not divide their property whoever is impacted so i will uh, i will end it just by asking you to to clarify what is involved with taking private property from the rural township folks that never got the vote on this. So thank you for your time and I'll just listen. All right, thank you, Mr. Hughes. Um, we will have, we don't have an answer today for you on that. We absolutely are trying to find um, partners in this and would like to find a, a, build a consensus to build this trail. It is not our intention to have to quote, take land. And so we're not prepared to answer that question today. Um, I see a lot of questions um, kind of regarding um, some of the cost analysis of the rural versus the urban routes. And the answer is we don't know yet. To be honest, we're really looking at this urban route as a relatively new idea based on some initial feedback from some of the rural property owners. Um, and so that is an area for further study for us to have to do in order to be able to answer the cost segment of the question. Um, and then the same, a lot of the questions asking like, well, what would my street look like? Or, you know, how narrow would the road be? We don't have those answers yet for you. What we're really trying to get a sense from you today is, do you like the idea of the urban route and would you want to explore it further? Is the rural route more what you're interested in? Um, no matter what we build, it will be a 10 foot wide paved path that is separated from the road. That's kind of a, a key decision marker there. I'm gonna take another raised hand. Um, let's see, we have um, Beata and I, I hesitate to say your last name, ma'am, but I'm going to let you unmute. Vieta. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, I wanted to, so I live on Prevalent Drive. I want to start from saying thank you for doing the work with the trails. I use the trails. I love them. I really do feel fortunate to be living here in this town. I mean, I've been here for 30 years now almost. And I love the trails that are here in existence. What I love about them is that it is, you know, a trail. It's not a walk in town, right? If I want to go to town, I certainly can go uptown and enjoy my time over there. But when I want to have, you know, a rec recreational trail and like, you say those trails are for the skateboarders and bikers and walkers. And uh, in all honesty, so currently both plans seem to be going straight in front of my house on my sidewalk. And in my neighborhood, there are a lot of children who walk to school bus. And uh, when I am thinking of skateboarders and bikers being in place of my current uh, sidewalk, where which my child would use for walking towards school bus. I mean, well, my child concretely, my children grew up, but, but there are many children in the neighborhood. I, it kind of scares me, especially skateboard. Uh, and, mm, and then you mentioned earlier that if it is taken uh, on the property, then the property owner will be, um, that this will be maintained by the city and not by the property owner and the insurance will be by the city and not by me. So currently the sidewalk technically is the city property. Uh, so I don't know if I would be included in this because I am not a property owner of the area that you plan to use for this trail. However, my current insurance does cover accidents in front of my house on that sidewalk. So would that be taken away? How will it affect my insurance price if I have skateboarders going through my sidewalk, right? Which is looking different, but technically it is still my sidewalk. And uh, 
um, I am uh, and like uh, maintenance, like uh, removal of snow and everything that would be done by the city or by me or because you mentioned this earlier, but you said if it is on the property, on the private property, but my sidewalk technically is not a private property. Um, so I am concerned about this and I, I am very, so I have two points to make. First of all, I do believe, I mean, I am sure you can do a survey on this, that if I am going on a trail, I am interested in some rural area in, you know, enjoying nature, not going through neighborhoods and seeing houses. And like here right now, if you look at the blue trail, I mean, is it really a trail? It's just, it's just uh, a route, kind of like a, it's not even particularly scenic to take through town. I mean, am I going to be attracted to, to walk there or, or do That's anything like that? I really don't see how this will be an attractive part of the trail for me. Um, I, am, I would be attracted. I am kind of, you know, it was exciting to have, you know, a loop that I can go start uh, close to the trail and go on a loop and come back home and on my bike and stuff. That sounds wonderful, but I really would want something more scenic. So I wonder, and I don't know the property down, okay. but I, wa I wonder if you considered a route that goes a little bit further out, maybe even using existing roads like Taylor and, and uh, um, Running out of for space. But the further out. But thank you and for your Greenwood. thank Greenwood you for your road and Taylor Road to Contreras. Those are existing roads, which are rural, uh, and uh, very beautiful around there. Uh, did you consider that? Because like I see that the orange trail that went around the property you said that was Dudley property, um, that somehow is not on this final map but it was on one of the earlier maps so I, I am very much in favor of rural solution thank you very much for those comments we'll add those to the record and we're gonna just for the sake of time move on to the next question thank you um i have a steve sullivan with a hand raised go ahead mr sullivan okay um Thanks for taking my question. I live on um, 104 Marty Court and may, actually maybe more of a comment than a question. Um, my family and I moved here from Chicago uh, where of course there's an extensive bike path network, both um, analogous to what you're proposing as the rural and the urban systems. And they are really working hard to increase both of those systems because they recognize all of the benefits that come from those. Um, and of course, also by making these systems, it preserves greenways, which is also critically important. Any city that doesn't preserve its greenways at the stage that Oxford is presently really regrets it in the future and ends up spending a lot of time and money to try to reclaim those greenways. So I think this planning we're doing on both respects is really smart. Um, of course, bike trails, either of these um, increase uh, uh, recreation opportunities, decrease commute times, and so they're gonna increase both quality of life and health and, and overall public health. So I think that's really important too. So in that, in that frame of mind, I really love both of the trails that are proposed, both the rural and the urban. Um, in my mind, it, it, just based on this presentation and some of the other things I've heard, I would prioritize the rural trail simply because it does preserve those green spaces. It's going to be the most straightforward to accomplish um, and it's gonna benefit the greatest number of people. That said, I also really like what's being proposed for the urban trails. Um, I think the bike boulevards are really smart. Um, you know, I commute, I commute by bike around here in Oxford all the time, and most people are somewhere between courteous drivers and excellent drivers, but every so often you get that jerk in the, uh, in the car that, that, that tries to run you off the road or something like that, um, or the inattentive person who just doesn't notice a bike there, and those bike boulevards really help that. Um, and also I like that it's been stressed that you're gonna be using existing right-of-ways. We're not taking away anybody's property. Um, and I like that you're talking about um, 
restricting some of the tr car traffic flow. You know, plenty of studies have shown that as we widen streets, it doesn't decrease traffic uh, or, or increase speed, it simply adds more cars. Um, so the, the rural routes are, for, from my perspective, would make a fast, safe commute. Um, I also did prior to this meeting, just some quick um, literature searching and saw that uh, as I experienced in Chicago nationwide, home prices tend to increase um, apparently up to about 5% when they are near these rural routes. And, um, and also that crime is not correlated with the bike routes according to any of the studies that I came across. So I, I thought that was really important. Um, of course, personally as somebody who uses these all the time, I see that really the majority of our community are great people and we're all helping to police each other. And so at, at the very least that's gonna be happening but also just seeing these studies makes me feel a little better. Um, in the end, I, 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 as I've said, I, I really go for the, the rural one. It wouldn't benefit me personally quite as much, but I think it would benefit the community more. And I think that sets a good standard for us to then jump into some of these other streets. Like, you know, Contreras would be a great example that if we can make your bike boulevards there eventually and create a hub and spoke system, the, the, the hub being this rural route that takes us all around the city, attracts money, increases our health, and then the spokes that really gets us into all of these shops or work or wherever we need to go. Those are my thoughts anyway. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. All right, um, I, I'm gonna answer a few written questions that I saw, some of them around, um, you know, like if you're in proximity to farmland or the landscaping that's included in trail design. So when we actually do the construction um, engineering of the trail, floods are accounted for, waterways, we do a full environmental analysis. And then yes, we would do, um, think of it like a greenway where we would plant like buffers of trees and, um, you know, ornamental landscaping, things like that um, to protect the trail users, really no matter where you are, whether that's a rural or urban route, that's an important part of it. So um, let's see, I have another raised hand, um, Mr. I think it's, I'm sorry, I'm going to, James Chadez, perhaps, or I'm sorry if I said it wrong. Um, oh, where'd you go? The hand went away. Okay, we'll go to the next one, which is um, John Femiani. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, to begin with, I mean, I, I think I've heard a lot of good things. I wanna reiterate some points that I actually heard before you got to me. So one is um, when we talked about trails, um, I don't think I pictured what we're calling an urban trail and nothing that exists so far is an urban trail. I, I don't really see the urban trail option as kind of within what we all imagined when we kind of approved this tax levy. I, I think that this notion that you're gonna take already bikeable urban areas that already have sidewalks and just widen the sidewalk, that just seems fundamentally not the same as what we expected when we approved, when we approved these trail ideas. So I, I wanted to get that one out. Um, the other thing I, I want to ask is um, the rural trails go right up to my backyard. How are are you gonna be able to get the 20 feet of right of way between our properties without buying it from us? I'm, I'm curious. I'm gonna to have to pass that one to Ms. Reed. Do you, can you maybe answer that question? Sure, um, um, I apologize, um, Air, uh, John, I, I didn't catch where you live, but- um, Oh, 412 Jacob Drive, sorry. Oh, okay, not a problem. So um, the, the rural route, which would be located behind your property, would, um, what we would be doing as, since it is a rural route located on private property, either the city would acquire an easement from that property owner, owner or they would go into negotiations and acquire, actually acquire a strip of land to put the trail into. Um, so the, the easements with vary, um, we would need at least a minimum of 20 or more feet to accommodate the trail and the buffer areas. Um, but the, the exact easement width would be determined as part of the construction process. 
there's a lot of people that you're going to have to get <laughs> property from in order to make the path as you've got it scoped. Have you considered just going up Brown Road and somehow trying to connect it to Todd further up? I mean, does it have to be so close to the to the city? Well, one of the benefits of the um, rural route in this segment being closer to the homes rather than up along Brown Road um, is the fact that the, the residents there in the neighborhoods in Northridge along Hester um, is that they can easily access it because that is one of the criteria we evaluated was the accessibility for the users to the trail. Um, if the trail is located way north along Brown Road, um, the residents would need to either go to the east over to Brown Road to head up to the north to utilize the trail or they'd have to go to 27 and then um, hop on the trail to, to, to go north around that portion. So it was really, um, we were looking more for the accessibility to the users. So let me, as somebody who lives on that street, let me tell you right now, it is very accessible to get to Brown Road. Um, it's, it's very easy, it's a straight shot. We've already got that cut through you were talking about. The sidewalks are already great all the way to Brown and all the way to Todd. So, I mean, it really doesn't seem like there's any value added in the blue line. And I see the yellow line is really challenging. Also, Todd Road leads to Houston Woods, Brown Road leads to Houston Woods. That's a great destination that people would wanna to bike to. People do dangerously bike and jog along those roads. A bike trail that skirted along those roads for at least part of the way would be, I think, a huge benefit. Mr. Fimiani, thank you for those comments. That's, and, that's the end for me, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you, it's, it's great to hear this, and I'm gonna ask you if you have thoughts like these, please do put them in writing on that public comment form. These are, you know, these are the kind of things that residents help us, um, you know, we really do process your thoughts and your thinking. So if you could take the time to write those thoughts down for us too, that would be very helpful. Um, thank you. The next um, hand raised I have is um, a Miss Engel. Ruth Engel, go ahead. Hello, um, I have a couple of questions. From your diagram or design, the urban design, the urban dimensions were really kind of at least hazy to me. What is the current uh, easement? In other words, the distance between the sidewalk and the curb of the street that the city has. That varies street to street. And, and when I say that, that's because if you, as you travel through Oxford, you've probably noticed that the streets are not cons consistent with, therefore the right-of-ways are not a consistent with. So um, we will have to look at each segment. Um, if we pursue the urban um, trail corridor, we will have to look at each segment one by one to determine um, what, that, what that width would be. Okay, um, <clears throat> when I was working for a surveyor and that was years ago, we were usually allotted six feet between curb and uh, the edge of the sidewalk. But I, I know that that is city and many other things dependent. Uh, the other thing that I was going to say is that the schematic that you showed had trees between the edge of the roadbed and the trail, not, tree, not a, from what I had understood when you were talking is that there was going to be a scenic break or whatever you wanna call it between the front of the house or the edge of the property and the trail. In other words, the trees would be on the other side or whatever. Uh, which, which one, which interpretation is correct, I guess? Sure, so what we would be looking to do is provide the trees um, kind of as a street tree program, essentially, which the city does have in all new developments. It would be trees located between the back of curb and the proposed trail. So the trees would be located in the public right of way. So the 10 feet would actually be more than 10 feet in order to have room for the trees. So you would have the 10 foot trail, then you would have a several feet to provide what we would call a tree lawn where we would plant the trees. Then you would have a back of curb where the street would start. Okay. 
And the other thing that I was going to say is Contreras right now um, has considerable easement already they, from the roadbed itself all the way to the edge of the uh, sidewalk. It's definitely more than 10 feet. It's something that you already have designed into the system. And it is something that with proper grading, uh, I mean, that it's not free obviously to use, but it is something that I see no, or nothing really stated here would make Contreras actually safer because there would be something between the roadway and the side and the trail itself, which right now that isn't much and it could utilize already existing easement. Thank you, Ms. Engel, for those comments and thoughts. Um, I um, have another written question that I would want to address, which is um, the cost difference between the two. And that is something for us to acknowledge. And that is the rural route will be very expensive. Um, it requires land acquisition um, in building it out there. And, and currently, just to kind of give you a, the scale, the trail is about a million dollars a mile, um, which just astounds me to this day, but it's the truth. And, and so we really, it's something for us to consider. And the urban route, while expensive, has potential to possibly be more affordable and to be able to stretch those tax dollars and those grant dollars a little further. It doesn't mean it's the only decision factor by any means. And we're definitely hearing a lot of feedback from you, which I greatly appreciate. But I also wanna make sure that people understand that that's one of our decision criteria as well. Um, I'm gonna take the next raised hand, which is um, Mr. Benamati, go ahead. And then I see Mr. James Chattis, you'll be next, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I'm in the same boat kind of as Terry Hughes was. I'm one of the most effective landowners. In fact, I've got 2,100 or so feet. And then, the, I mean, the trail completely wraps around my property. It's the, the box that juts in on the map. I'm already struggling to keep people off my property. I mean, I've had uh, Oxford Township police out there twice in the last 10 days because I've had some stuff stolen off my property. And uh, apparently there were some people living on my property uh, the, it, it, in being in the township, it's going to be hard for OPD to patrol this trail in the, in the rural route, and it's going to be going behind all those houses on Hester, Jacob, Northridge, etc. I mean, I see crime going up, not going down, so I, I just wanted to voice the same opinion as Terry, and I really am not very fond of having this wrap around my property, um, so I just wanted that to go on the record. Thank you for that. Next, um, Mr. Your name keeps popping away. There we go. Mr. Um, I believe it's Chadez. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, James Chagdis at 209 Country Club Drive. So I share uh, many of the concerns and, and comments that people have made already, but I wanted to ask a couple of specific questions. So one is um, in section one, the, the um, route was moved to the rural area to avoid going through the knolls, which I think is great. I, I kind of had that concern for that section one, um, but when moving to section two and three, I guess, and, and through four, the same concern with the, um, the urban area. And I'll specifically talk first about section two, because I think you, you can choose the yellow route uh, to be the rural area, but going through Prevalent Drive, I, I do have a concern of going through Prevalent Drive, and then I guess if you were to take the blue route, also cutting over on, on uh, Old Farm and Grace Lane, but isn't there a chance or, or a possibility that you could instead come out head west on Contreras, I think it was to an orange route, then head north, go behind the Prevalent neighborhood rather than cutting through their neighborhood to get to the yellow route? I, don't, I really don't see why we have to cut through um, the prevalent neighborhood. I, I saw there was an orange route and then I think there was a magenta route. If you are able to go back to section two slide, I, I don't see why you'd have to cut through the um, prevalent drive, take contrarious to prevalent drive. So that that's my first question. I guess I, I, I wonder if there's a reason why that was avoided or if that just was not taken into consideration. We'll have to go look at that. I don't know if we can answer it on the fly, but thank you for that comment. We'll go take a, a deeper look. 
Okay, and then take a stab at that, Jessica. Go ahead, Sam. Um, hi, Jim. Thanks for the question. Uh, I think, kind of as we alluded to earlier, uh, it's probably going to come down to cost. Uh, so, you know, with land acquisition and uh, additional mileage, those are all cost considerations. And essentially, this is a taxpayer funded project. So that'll be have to uh, be part of the decision making process. But thank you. Okay, and I guess when it comes to that, I guess one of the things that that Miss Etta Reed said in the beginning, she mentioned all the criteria used for the feasibility study, and in that list of criteria, there was never anything mentioned about the consideration of the impact that the construction would have on the residents of these different neighborhoods. There was a lot of yeah, we want to have access to the to the routes, but I think that's been explained that everyone does have access cutting through a neighborhood especially I'm thinking about Country Club, we've gone through a development which appears to most neighbors as being a failure right now. And now you're wanting to go through our neighborhood again. It seems like, you know, we bought this house in this neighborhood and you're, get, you're completely trying to drastically change it once again. So that kind of leads up to a follow-up. I'll let you answer that. And I guess I'll ask my last question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, I'll take that one too. Uh, and this is the kind of thing we need to hear and we were hoping to hear what the concerns were so we could better address them. Um, and in and, and Ms. Reed's defense, um, city staff wrote the criteria in the RFP and we selected Bear Becker and KZF and that you're correct, that was not one of the criteria. So that will have to be part of the, uh, the comments that we're taking in and how we would handle those. So I appreciate that a lot. And go on to your next question. Okay, last one, I'll keep it simple is how, what would the, um, so we live on the backside of the blue line, we, uh, share the, our backyard leads to the country club. How far off of our property line would trees be removed for this path so we haven't talking... gotten to that yeah we haven't gotten to that level of detail yet uh, it has we haven't sent surveyors out at this point so it's it's just a line uh, so it's a little bit more detailed than what was done in 2007 we will end up with a 30 percent design which will have a little bit more of that detail in it uh, so we don't have an answer at this time thank you okay i'll limit my time to three minutes and i'll put other questions or comments into the uh, survey thank you thank you very much Okay, next we have um, a Miss Zicky. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. This is Susie Zizicki. I live on Country Club Drive. And I, I repeat what everybody who supports bike trails, I repeat all of that. But I also would like to repeat many of the, the concerns. And if, if you find that the blue line impacts too many homeowners who are concerned, who say we already can just get on our bikes or walk on the sidewalk. So why this isn't really giving us new access. So if you find that that's the predominant viewpoint on the view, blue line, and also for the blue line commuting, they we can hop on our bikes and go down our street to commute. So it's not really taking us where we're going for commuting. And if you find the yellow line is too expensive at this point, how stuck are you on a perimeter, the, a circle around the city right now? I, I understand this design was maybe, I don't know if this was what was proposed 30 years ago or if it was what was proposed in 2007, but if there's feedback that neither urban or rural in this Northwestern arc is feasible, desirable, gives the goal of commuting where I would never take this route to commute, I just get on Contreras. Would you consider making it not a circle around the city in this Northwestern Arc section. I mean, that is a really good question and I don't know if I have the answer, <clears throat> but um, you know, I think if enough residents share a similar sentiment, that might be something that we could talk about. I don't, I don't have an answer for you today, um, but if you could please, you know, write those comments into the, the public comment section. Sam, did you wanna say a bit more? Yeah. yeah, I'll just touch on um, Susie's comment about using the street. Uh, definitely the streets are, are usable and allowed by Ohio laws for bicyclists. Uh, the goal um, going back to uh, 2013 and, and later in 2017 when the trail first phase one was built was to provide a little bit more of a safety buffer 
And so studies have shown that separated paths have been safer for uh, users who are less able. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That is one of our key criteria is a separated um, path. That's, that's one of our key decision points there. Um, next, I have um, a Mr. McCabe. Go ahead. Mr. McCabe, you're still muted. Go ahead. We should hear you now. Mm. Mr. McCabe, we're having trouble hearing you. We'll come back to you. All right, we have um, Mr. Hayes. Go ahead, Mr. Hayes. Greetings, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, um, so I'm kind of looking at this as a, um, a distinguished pro property owner with my yard surrounded by a yellow line. Um, I'm hearing the comments and particularly, I find it a little, a little self-serving that all the people would love to ride their bikes or take a hike or a stroll in the country. But those who live there don't necessarily want a 20 foot wide highway of you know, walkers and bikers on two sides of the property. I mean, we don't necessarily want it as much as a person in town doesn't want the people trepsing, you know, in front of, behind their properties. So I'm not speaking as a advocate and I'm not speaking as an opponent. I'm just saying, is this really necessary? I mean, if you improve the, um, existing bikeways, if you improve the, the side, sides of roads, people who are inclined to bike, stroll, or walk can do it. So rather than build and it, rather than acquire people's properties, just make existing infrastructure more accommodating. And then we're all in this, we all benefit. Every single person in the city will benefit. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just thinking, this is like almost vanity. Somebody sitting in offices looking at maps says, oh, wouldn't it be cool to put a circle around the city? Let's make the internal infrastructure better. Those who wanna take a ride into the countryside I've ridden over 10,000 miles in this, in this region on a bike. So why not just fix up the roads and the highways and the borders of, of rural roadways? And it's quite, it's people who, who wish to get around will get around. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Um, Okay, Mr. McCabe, let's try one more time. Mr. McCabe? All right, we still can't. Oh, go ahead. Nope, okay. George, you could type your question in the box. Yeah, if you, you would type respond. your question in the box. So we are coming up at, with three minutes till 1.30. So I think this is a good time. And I we read through the Q&A real quick. And I think we touched on most themes, if you will. If we did not get to your question today or um, you know, you, you have more thoughts, I really encourage you to once again, go to that um, cityofoxford.org slash trail public input. And please share your thoughts with us. If for whatever reason that website link does not work for you, you are welcome to email Ms. Etta Reed at BayerBecker.com. And you are also welcome, you know, I've had people sending us letters um, just in the mail, that that's fine too. I, I'm going to spend my afternoon kind of getting this recording um, uploaded 
and I'm going to post PDFs of the maps. And so that'll be done by the end of the day today on the City of Oxford website and the OxfordAreaTrails.org website. And I encourage you to share this with your friends, your family, um, and other residents, because the more voices we hear, the better decisions that we can make. Um, and so thank you for your time today. Um, and we had 130 people on the call, which is pretty exciting. And that's, that's a really good turnout. And um, we're excited to hear your feedback and your thoughts. And um, we'll go from there. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. And um, we'll be in touch. Thanks. Bye-bye.